All right, welcome back. Uh, I'm happy to be uh, back on a Wednesday evening to contribute a second talk to our virtual cultural program. Uh, and today we're going to be talking about another neighborhood of the city of Florence, uh, or really a street, uh, the Costa San Giorgio, which is in the Otrarno neighborhood, the neighborhood on the south side of the Arno River here in Florence. Um, just a reminder again, for those of you who are maybe joining us for the first time, uh, we have muted you now for the duration of the presentation, and we'd like to open this up to questions and answers afterwards. If you would let, not like to be heard, just make sure that your microphone button is muted, and that way, uh, if you don't want to be heard, you won't be. Uh, but we're going to hope that everyone gets a bit better at this as we go on, and I'm going to now begin the talk taking a look at an area which I think for me is maybe the only part of the city that I would prefer to talk about virtually rather than being there myself because even though Florence is a uh, gloriously flat city, um, if you're familiar with other Tuscan cities on the tops of the hill like Siena or San Gimignano or Cortona or Perugia where you've got these extraordinarily grueling hills to get up and down to visit the monuments. Uh, we don't have much of that in the historic center of Florence, but in the Otrarno we do have a couple of steeply inclining streets, which in Florentine are referred to as coste. So this word does not mean coast, it actually means a um, extraordinarily upward way or, 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 or street. Um, so we're going to be talking about one of them. I think we only have about three or four in the city that are actually referred to officially as coste. Uh, here is a modern view of what that uh, street looks like. So you can see that making your way up the top and looking back into town, you can see the rooftops of the center as well as the Palazzo della Giustizia uh, going out towards the airport. Um, what I'd like to do is again, continue a theme that I guess I established uh, a couple of weeks ago. Uh, for those of you who are able to join us, we looked at the Piazza della Santissima Annunziata uh, and some of the history and the art um, connected to that area of the city. Uh, we're going to go way over to the other side of town now. Florence isn't that big, but it's big enough to make a, a pretty dramatic switch here from north of the cathedral to south of the river. Uh, and we're going to be taking a look at some of the monuments that we have in this area. What you can see here is an aerial view produced by Google Earth, uh, looking uh, sort of southward from above the cathedral to give you a better view. Uh, you might be able to recognize the Palazzo Pitti, the Boboli Gardens. Over here we have the Piazzale Michelangelo and the beautiful Church of San Mignato al Monte. Uh, what we're going to be talking about today is a road that begins just uh, sort of after the Ponte Vecchio on the south side of the river in the Piazza Santa Felicita and winds its way up this hill, uh, which is known historically as the Monte San Giorgio. All right, And on this hill we've got a lot of stuff. I'm actually happy to be uh, broadcasting, let's say, uh, not from my living room. Uh, you might have read in the news if you're um, overseas that we have begun a partial and very cautious lifting of restrictions here in Italy. Uh, so I'm actually able to be here in the library. Um, I'm not too far from some of the places that we're going to be talking about. Uh, but just so you get an idea, we can take a look very briefly at the Bardini Villa and Gardens. We're also going to take a look at the so-called Casa di Galileo Galilei. We will also take a look at the Porta San Giorgio. We'll take a look at the Fortezza, uh, uh, the Forte Belvedere, uh, the church or the Chiesa di San Giorgio alla Costa, the ex caserma Vittorio Veneto, and the church of the Santa Felicita. So even though we're just walking up one road of the city, as I would say back home, I would say historically speaking, the Costa San Giorgio is one hell of a hill. So let's get started. Um, I think for those of you on your exercise bikes or treadmills, uh, if you've actually taken me up on that sort of joke offer, uh, we'll start you off light uh, just south of the Ponte Vecchio to take a look at the Chiesa di Santa Felicita. Uh, which uh, in terms of its foundation is potentially the second oldest church in the city after the founding of San Lorenzo. Uh, we believe that it was Syrian Greek merchants in the second century who settled in this area and brought Christianity to the city of Florence. The church was reconstructed in the 11th century and then largely restructured at the beginning of the 18th century uh, based on the designs of Ferdinando Ruggeri. So even though we have a sort of a not very descriptive exterior here, let's say, uh, of what awaits inside, what you will notice is that the facade is 
uh, blocked by the passage of the Vasari Corridor, which was designed in the 16th century to connect the Palazzo Vecchio and the administrative offices of the Uffizi uh, by way of the Ponte Vecchio through the neighborhood of the Oltarno to the courtly residence of the Medici Dukes and Grand Dukes di Palazzo Pitti. Uh, so one, when this was designed, uh, basically because this is such an important church historically for the city of Florence, uh, the design of the Villar Corridor allowed for uh, almost a bit of a sort of an opera box, let's say a private access to the nave of the church uh, from which the Medici could listen to mass without being seen by the attendants on the ground floor. Uh, if you take a look at the interior of the church uh, from this photograph, which is taken from that outlet of the Vasari Quarter, you can see that it is rather modern uh, for Florentine standards. Again, a lot of our oldest churches were um, broadly renovated uh, in the 16th and 17th centuries following the uh, proclamations of the Council of Trent. Uh, what we have here is a single nave. Uh, we believe that the earlier church probably would have been a more traditional three-aisled nave. Uh, this is a better view of the interior from the ground floor. Again, these uh, the, the architecture here, uh, what we're seeing in this shot, um, is largely thanks to the designs of Fernando Ruggeri, all right? Uh, but this is an ancient church and uh, the sacristy, parts of the monastery, other areas of the church that you might not be able to view directly from the nave uh, still reflect the historical importance of the church. Uh, what I'm showing you here is a beautiful altarpiece together with its base or predella, which was painted by a Florentine artist named Neri di Bici, and it's a representation of Santa Felicita, after whom the church is uh, named and, and, and dedicated to. She was an early Christian martyr together with her seven uh, children, uh, like many of the earliest saints that we have uh, in the Levant as well as in Rome, uh, they meet awful deaths. And so whenever we see paintings of saints like this holding palm fronds, that's typically a general symbol of martyrdom. And we can see uh, a bit more detail um, related to their story depicted in the predella below. There were excavations uh, carried out in the piazza in front of the church, as well as some of the areas nearby in the 1930s uh, in order to understand better uh, the actual historical situation of this church. Not a lot of it was documented, and so they were able to find uh, several areas containing tombs. They were able to find the foundations of uh, some of the structures related to the earlier church complex. Um, and based on that, architects and architectural historians have attempted to reconstruct what the situation would have been, uh, taking a look at a very small church here uh, in the center of the nave that would have been probably the uh, second century uh, or third century uh, um, oratory uh, that was later demolished to make way for the 11th century church. Um, going into the Brunelleschian sacristy, we can also find an example of the medieval decorative programs uh, that were employed here in the church. This is a crucifixion in fresco painted by Niccolo di Pietro Gerini. Uh, so even though the sort of first glance, the first impression of the church seems quite modern, we've got some great examples of local Florentine art from earlier periods. Um, most of you probably know about the Santa Felicita church because it's also the home of an important family chapel, uh, which is known today as the Caponi Chapel. When it was designed in the 15th century by Filippo Bernaleschi, uh, it was commissioned from the Barbadori family who later sold that to the Caponi. Uh, for those of you who have taken our Renaissance Art in Florence class, um, our lecture on Florentine mannerism, which is usually delivered either by myself or my colleague Lisa Cabarica, uh, tends to be cut short. We would like to get you out of the classroom at four o'clock because this is right down the street from the library. Uh, and when the church reopens in the afternoon, we can go in to see one of the most celebrated works of art in the church, uh, which is the altarpiece of this chapel. Uh, what I'm showing you first um, is a rare example of surviving fresco by the hand of Jacopo Contormo, um, an annunciation on the counter facade wall. Incidentally, those of you who were with us um, a few weeks ago talking about the Santissima Annunciata uh, might recall that it is the uh, reverence of that particular image that um, inspires a tradition of depicting this particular scene on the counter facades of churches in Florence. Uh, and what we have in, above the altar 
uh, is one of the most important mannerist paintings here in Florence. The entombment, well, we're not really sure. The whole thing about mannerism is we never really know. Is this a deposition? Is it a lamentation? Is it an entombment? Uh, we're not really sure, but this is a painting which has been available for locals and visitors uh, ever since its installation into the chapel, just sort of walking right in. This is another church that has never been museumified. The most money that they ask of you is a couple of uh, coins to light up the light box, basically, to get a better view um, of the artwork in the chapel. The daughter of Lorenzo the Magnificent um, in the early 1700s, it was largely redesigned by Giovanni Battista Foggini, uh, including the high altar of the church. Uh, it was suppressed briefly during the Napoleonic uh, occupation in the early 1800s, uh, but then was uh, reconsecrated, if you like. And so today, this church is actually the meeting place of the Romanian Orthodox Congregation of Florence. Here's a look at the inside, which I'm sure the exterior gives you no suggestion whatsoever of the sort of opulence that we have uh, reflecting early 18th century uh, taste. Uh, including the beautiful fresco in the ceiling of the nave authored by Alessandro Gerardini, showing the glory of St. George. We have a couple of historic paintings that are no longer located in the church. They're actually in museums in Florence today. Uh, this is a result of the suppression of a lot of these religious spaces and their convents. Uh, you may have heard of a work attributed to a very young Giotto uh, representing the Madonna and child. Uh, this is um, the property of the Diocese of Santo Stefano al Ponte. It's uh, basically never been on display uh, until recently. It did a bit of a tour going also up to Giotto's hometown uh, and then has been on temporary view in the Museo dell'Opera del Duomo. Uh, I'm not really sure what I think about this painting. It was already attributed to uh, Giotto by earlier historians, but um, it's sort of a, a strange work, perhaps an example of his juvenilia. Uh, what we can see next to it is a work by Alessio Baldovinetti, who again, you might remember from my talk on the Santissima Nunziata as the author of an important fresco in the Chiostrino dei Volti. This work is in the Galleria degli Uffizi today. And we also have an important work commissioned from Paolo Uccello for the decoration of the monastery, the convent. Uh, of this church. This work is in the academia today, uh, and it is a uh, work that represents the so-called uh, Teba, uh, Tebaid, which is a desert region around Thebes in Egypt uh, that was historically inhabited by early Christian hermits. Uh, it shows several of them in terms of the lives of these monastic and hermetic saints, including St. Francis, uh, Jerome, Bernard of Clairvaux, and Benedict of Nursia. Uh, a wonderful work that you can see in the first gallery once the uh, Galleria dell'Accademia reopens. Going up the hill, we can also see one of the important uh, gates of the fortifications, the circuit of walls that was constructed from the 1280s uh, right up until the 1330s. Uh, it is from that 10th century church of San Giorgio that this gate takes its name. Here you can see a photograph of it with a lovely uh, Florentine moment here, that dumpster just sort of, you know, rammed up right next to it. Uh, but what we have next to that is an illustration from the early 20th century uh, that was penned by Emilio Burci together with this one, uh, which shows you a view from just inside of the gate and the lunette, which contains a fresco I'll show you uh, in a minute. This is uh, a, a wonderful sort of romantic kind of representation of this place with all the vegetation sort of growing on the walls and things. Uh, don't assume that this is what it looked like always. We know that most of these gates had much taller uh, towers uh, incorporated in their construction with battlements. Uh, it was during the preparations for what Florentines were aware uh, was eminent, uh, the so-called Siege of Florence in uh, 1530, that Michelangelo, amongst others, uh, assisted in the lowering of these towers. This was really one of the first uh, conflicts in which um, cannon fire had become a reality for these uh, Italian cities, uh, even if they were encircled by medieval uh, walls, you know, cannons can do lots of damage uh, from, from outside within. Uh, so in order to make sure that these uh, passageways into the city weren't permanently blocked by uh, bombardment, these towers were lowered. So we can imagine that from the 16th century on, uh, this gate had its appearance. It is included in a wonderful uh, planimetric study produced by Baldassare Caruzzi, uh, I think probably for the CNEs, as they were thinking about how they could uh, maybe uh, assist in, in, in the uh, siege of Florence here. But you can see that the Porta San Giorgio is clearly marked here. 
as one of the principal access points into the city from the south side of the river. And here's a better view of the entrance with a copy of a relief sculpture attributed to Andrea Pisano. Uh, the original is today in the Palazzo Vecchio. It's been replaced with a copy, uh, but he is protecting the city here, we can imagine, uh, for all those coming in from outside. They would have had to pass by the authorities probably at this gate, declare who they were, what they were carrying into the city before receiving permission to enter into the city proper. Uh, this is one of the smallest gates, uh, really, that survive from the circuit of walls that were demolished in the 19th century, uh, and in my humble opinion, one of the most beautiful. Uh, on the inner uh, sort of wall of the gate, we have a um, fresco, which is in very bad condition. Uh, this was a subject of a, of a cleaning of a conservation, a restoration really, in the uh, 1930s. Um, it has been, again, in the 21st century, the subject of a recent cleaning, uh, but it is authored by an artist named Bici di Lorenzo, and I want to take a point to uh, point this out to you, one of the challenges that we have studying the art of Florence and uh, what all of the students of Florentine painting uh, learn to dread uh, when it comes to keeping all of these different artists uh, sort of sorted and separate. Um, I had shown you a painting uh, representing uh, Santa Felicita by an artist named um, Neri di Vici. Um, he was actually the son of this artist, uh, who was the son of another artist. And what we have here is a great example of something which is absolutely confounding for foreign students of these artists or uh, Florentines in general. Uh, we have a patronymic tradition uh, which I'm sure you understand what it is, even if you've never heard of this term. Uh, this is the tradition of naming uh, someone or referring to someone by the identity of their father. Uh, lots of surnames in uh, British and Nordic tradition uh, embody this. If you think of names like Erickson or Smithson or McDonald or O'Brien, you know, you get the general idea. Uh, what we have also on top of that in Florence is an avonymic tradition, which means that in addition to referring to somebody by who their father was, um, it was and is still uh, in, in many parts of Tuscany uh, traditional to name the firstborn son uh, after the grandfather. So basically a way to pay homage to your father is to name your firstborn son after him. Um, this together with the sort of referencing of people by their father give us these really bizarre sort of generations of artists. In the case of this family, you know, we have three generations of painters. Uh, we have Lorenzo de Bici, who has a son named Bici di Lorenzo, who then has a son named Neri di Bici. So, you know, if you feel like you're reading, uh, you know, articles online and you, and, you, and you thought you heard this name, but you remembered it differently, uh, chances are you've got uh, this sort of thing at work. Um, and I just want to point that out to you, not to discourage anyone from studying um, art history here in Florence, but uh, certainly, you know, this is what we have to contend with. Um, anyway, back to the fresco, you can see here, uh, the photograph is bad. The condition is also bad. Uh, this is an early photograph um, showing us what that would have looked like uh, basically following the early 20th century restoration. Uh, typically when these works were addressed, they were detached from their walls uh, in order to locate the synopiae or the preparatory drawings that were applied to the ariccio layer of plaster lying underneath. Uh, in this case, the synopia for this lunette uh, representing the virgin and child between St. George and Leonard uh, is in the courtyard, the men's cloister of the Hospital of the Innocents that we looked at a few weeks ago. Uh, they are already, oh sorry, they are already um, talking about cleaning this um, as part of a big project that started back in 2018 to restore the lunettes of the city gates. Uh, there was a massive amount of money uh, put into this about 25,000 euro just for this particular uh, lunette. It was part of a larger project of about 5 million uh, looking at ways to restore these works of art that had been uh, outside and sort of exposed to the elements. Uh, basically what they're planning to do is following the modern uh, restoration of these frescoes, uh, display them permanently inside of the Biblioteca degli Oblate, the Oblate Library, for those of you who are familiar with Florence. Uh, and I don't know if they're gonna put copies back up on the gates, but basically the last gates that they're getting to are going to be the Porta Romana and the Porta San Ferdiano. So we'll see what happens there. Um, if you were to walk outside of that gate, which is uh, here in the photograph, you can see the very imposing uh, bastions of the so-called Forte Belvedere. 
These ramparts and fortifications are based on the designs of an important Florentine architect uh, named Bernardo Bontalenti, who I have to confess I've developed a bit of a crush uh, over uh, preparing for this talk. Um, I wanted to show you, first of all, the um, Palazzina, which is a pre-existing uh, villa that was um, constructed by Bartolomeo Amanati earlier in the 16th century. Uh, but by the time we get to the 1590s, this art architect, Bontalenti, uh, is asked, asked by the Medici Grand Dukes to uh, construct a fortification. Uh, this follows shortly the completion of the better known Fortezza di Basso that we have closer to the train station. Uh, and this is really an extraordinary work of engineering. Here you can see on the famous Monsignori map, uh, which was produced uh, around the same time. This was such a large endeavor for this cartographer, Stefano Bonsignori, that he had to uh, work on the uh, matrices of the prints used to produce this map over several years. So we actually have early versions or variations of the map uh, showing the area before the construction of the Fortezza and then after the construction of the Fortezza, all right? Uh, here is a later plan giving you an idea of these spade-shaped bastions, which again are designed now uh, with the aim of withstanding cannon fire, uh, positioned very close to the Bobolli Gardens and what remains the seat of courtly life well into the uh, 17th century, the uh, Palazzo Pitti. Uh, this is a work which is part of a um, duchy-wide, grand duchy-wide project to fortify major cities and ports. What I'm showing you here are some of the Medici fortresses that we can find. Uh, also in Livorno, Arezzo, uh, two of the ports on the island of Elba, and further south in Grosseto and Siena. So it's by no means unique, but it is part of a comprehensive plan uh, to uh, militarize, let's say, uh, the infrastructure of major cities of the Grand Duchy. Uh, we know about that uh, part of history and the residences of the Medici thanks to a program of lunettes that were commissioned by the Flemish artist uh, Justo Utens, Justus Utens. Uh, here is an old photograph showing what we believe their original situation uh, would have been in the um, villa uh, of Artemino. Uh, these are the lunettes and I'm showing you three in red that were also uh, the villa is designed by the same architect, Bernardo Bontalenti. So he was an extraordinarily productive artist. Uh, if you have uh, a knowledge of Florence, which is limited to the center, um, you might recognize his work in the facade of the Church of the Santa Trinita, just between the British Institute's language and cultural centers here. Um, I'm showing you an interior of the nave of that church, which was uh, drastically renovated in the 19th century in an effort to bring it back to what people at the time believed was a medieval appearance. We have prints that show us what the high altar uh, of that church looked like for a time. Uh, and what I'm showing you here is the staircase that was also designed together with the facade for this church by Bernardo Bontalenti. Now, because this was considered such an important example uh, of Mannerist um, architecture, it was not destroyed. It was preserved and transported to the church of San Stefano al Ponte. So if you've been there for any of the projections or concerts that they do, um, you can see the stairway that was originally uh, you know, made for the church of the Santa Trinita uh, before it was reverted back to sort of a neo-Gothic appearance. So you know, there's Bernardo all over the place here. Um, he is the architect of the famous uh, Grotta Grande or Grotta di Montalenti, uh, which is found at the base of the Boboli Hill. He is also the architect of the Tribune in the Uffizi, which is of course the nucleus uh, of exhibited artworks um, already beginning in the 16th century. That is the setting, of course, of the famous Zoffany painting that I think several of our speakers have shown. Uh, and if you're just going to get gelato on the bridge, he's also the author of one of uh, the, 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 the Florentine's favorite fountains of the city, uh, the so-called Fontana della Sprone, uh, which is just down the street from the Institute. And I gotta say this because, you know, if I'm boring you with architecture, he is also supposedly the inventor of gelato. So if you want to have a truly authentic, uh, you know, Florentine experience, uh, gelato uh, is absolutely uh, valid. It counts. Uh, the story goes that Catherine de' Medici, Caterina de' Medici, uh, needed to impress some important guests and basically ask uh, the members of her court, including the architects, of some new and novel dessert and the concept of adding 
uh, crushed ice and cream and egg, uh, you know, all together to make this sort of semifredo sort of dessert um, is attributed to uh, Bernardo Bontalenti. So um, it gives us the more generic sort of idea of crema alla Fiorentina as a flavor. Uh, the official gusto or flavor of Bontalenti is trademarked by the gelateria Madiani up on the Via de Mille by the stadium. Uh, but I'm totally losing my road here. So let's get back to the Costa San Giorgio and take a look again at the plan uh, or an aerial view rather of that fortress. Uh, this is a great place to visit once things open up again, because like many of the sort of areas of the city, this has been through uh, many sort of changes in terms of its, of its function. Uh, it had been closed down for a while. It was sort of restored in the 1950s, uh, closed down again, reopened in the early 21st century. And it has, with the exception of a couple of um, phenomenal exhibitions in the 1960s and 1980s, um, the idea to use this as a permanent venue for rotating contemporary sculpture exhibitions, uh, as well as ex exhibitions of painting and photography in the Palazzina, uh, really gets going in 2013. So what I'm showing you here are just some of the artists whose work have been featured in temporary exhibitions there on the bastions of the Forte Belvedere. Uh, the challenge that uh, was accepted by Bernardo Bontalenti in constructing the fortifications around the pre-existing Palazzina have to do with the fact that this building was constructed on the very top of this hill. And Bernardo Bontalenti knew perfectly well that this area of the city was under the constant threat of landslide and subsidence. And so the engineering uh, necessary to uh, construct around this pre-existing villa safely uh, was really um, a, a testament, let's say, to his uh, abilities in engineering. Um, it was actually Bernardo Bontalenti himself who almost died in one of those landslides as a child uh, back in 1547. He was orphaned when his house in the area uh, came down together with several others. This is a painting that was a fresco that was uh, produced much later for one of his uh, residences after achieving his fame as an architect, um, authored by Niccolò Lapi, which shows um, Bernardo Bontalenti being saved uh, from the ruins of his house. Uh, so it's sort of a nostalgic piece, you know, it's not really journalistic, uh, but it shows a young boy being sort of pulled out of the rubble. Um, he was not the only a uh, miraculous survivor of these landslides. You know, it's not just one. We have this happening throughout history on this very steep slope. Um, some of you who were in Florence back in 2016 might remember the famous collapse of the Lungarno Torrigiani embankment. Uh, this wasn't due to landslide. It was due to the collapse of a water main. But, um, you know, being someone who's parked a car there in the past, you know, it was a shock to everyone to see all of these parked cars are sitting in the water. Uh, this is the problem that we have with this area of the city. What you can see in the lower photograph is the um, neo-Renaissance facade uh, of the Palazzo Caponi. Uh, there are several palaces um, uh, historically owned by that family, and this one is distinguished uh, and referred to as the um, Palazzo Caponi alle rovinate, again, sort of an idea that this is the area where we have lots of sort of damaged houses that have to be uh, built on top of. Um, so, you know, thinking about that, I wanted to point out another uh, miraculous survivor of these historic landslides of the Costa San Giorgio, uh, and that is a painting um, authored by Raphael in the early 16th century, known as the Madonna del Cardellino or the Madonna of the Goldfinch. Here you can see the full painting. It's a representation of Madonna, the Christ child, and his cousin, St. John the Baptist, a uh, little San Giovannino, uh, who was offering a goldfinch, which is um, a sort of a benign symbol uh, and foreshadowing of Christ's own passion uh, to his cousin. This is a work that Vasari tells us about, uh, and I'm afraid that my things are blocking me here from reading my own text. So I'm gonna put you all away for a minute so I can see this. Vasari tells us uh, in his Life of Raphael um, about the fate of this painting. Um, first of all, he celebrates it as a beautiful example of, of Raphael's work here in Florence. Uh, but he tells us also uh, that Raphael became a close friend of Lorenzo Nasi, who had recently taken a wife, and he did a painting for him in which he showed a young boy uh, between the knees of Our Lady, to whom a youthful St. John joyfully offers a bird to the great delight and pleasure of both children. In the poses of both, there's a certain childish simplicity, which is wholly charming. And in addition, they are so carefully colored and carried out with such diligence that they seem more to be made of living flesh than of painted colors. 
Likewise, Raphael's Madonna possesses an expression that is truly full of grace and divinity, and to sum up, the plane, the landscape, and all the rest of the work are extremely beautiful. His painting was held by Lorenzo Nazi in the greatest veneration while he was alive, as much in memory of Raphael, who he had been a close friend, uh, as for the dignity uh, and excellence of the work. He goes on to tell us that in the year 1548, on the 17th of August, the painting met an unfortunate fate when Lorenzo's house, along with the extremely ornate and beautiful houses of the heirs of Marco del Nero and other nearby houses, collapsed during a landslide on Monte San Giorgio. Nevertheless, after the fragments of the work were recovered from beneath the rubble of ruined masonry, they were put back together again in the best way possible by Battista, son of the aforesaid Lorenzo, who was a great lover of art. So I'm showing you here is a photograph of that painting uh, prior to its most recent um, restoration. Uh, in this case, again, in the early 21st century, uh, this photograph was taken with raking light. Uh, that means that we've got a light source uh, very close to the side of the painting uh, to cast shadows along its surface. And in this light, we can see uh, that this is really a sort of cobbled back together again painting uh, from the fragment salvaged from this landslide. Uh, now, I just told you that Bernardo Bontalenti had survived a landslide in 1547. Uh, uh, and so I thought Vasari, he, he sort of, you know, makes a lot of mistakes. I thought he might have been wrong here uh, with the year 1548 in that this was uh, one in the same landslide. They were actually different. The 1547 landslide happened in November and the 1548 landslide happened in August of the following year. Uh, so this work, again, with x-ray shows you the fragments of the panel support as well as the huge uh, metal uh, spikes that were driven in to join those fragments together. Um, I'm showing you here a few examples of the painting during its uh, cleaning, uh, which uh, I think is one of the most successful examples of, of, of Italian uh, in-painting, retouching, uh, that we have available for us today. Uh, and this work is uh, rightly um, among the, the, the great masterpieces of the Uffizi now in the really design, uh, newly redesigned uh, rooms um, dedicated to Michelangelo and Raphael. So an incredible example, success story, let's say, of cleaning when uh, many of the earlier ones uh, tend to be quite disastrous. All right, moving up the hill, I want to go a little bit later into history and talk about the so-called uh, Casa Galileo that you can see here. Um, it's actually a cluster of properties that were purchased by the Galilei family. Uh, and uh, some of them were lived in uh, by members of the same family uh, right up until the early uh, 19th century. Uh, at number 11 on the Costa San Giorgio, you can see this stucco facade with a plaque, okay? Uh, I don't think I have to give too much of an introduction to Galileo Galilei, uh, considered uh, to be one of the first modern scientists introducing the world to a scientific method uh, based on empirical observation. Uh, it is here that we have a commemorative plaque um, set up by the city of Florence uh, to record his accomplishments. And I have to say, it's a bit misleading because the way they write it, it sounds like Galileo was living in this house his entire life. He, he barely spent any time here at all. Uh, was never truly a resident. But the plaque tells us that in the year 1609, Galileo Galileo, perfecting the use of the telescope, conducted the astronomical observations that would lead him to discover the Medici satellites of Jupiter. And of course, here we're talking about the four largest of the Jovian moons, uh, whose paths uh, of orbit uh, around the planet of Jupiter were observed by Galileo in early 1610. Uh, what we're seeing here, 169, is a Florentine year. We don't catch up with the Roman calendar until about 1700. Uh, so that's another thing you have to watch out for here in Florence. If you see a date, if something happened in the first third of the year, we don't have our new year until the Feast of the Annunciation on March 25th. So this is actually already 1610. What I'm showing you next to the plaque are the drawings made by Galileo uh, attempting to chart the progress of these satellites or moons around the planet of Jupiter from one of his earliest telescopes. These observations were conducted throughout January, February, and March of 1610 in the Veneto. Uh, and what I just want to show you here to think about how extraordinary this is, uh, with the technology that we have today, we are able to actually reconstruct the position of those moons 
at that time in history. And we can compare them to the drawings made by Galileo with one of his early telescopes, and they are practically precise. Uh, it's an extraordinary uh, achievement uh, and, and contribution to the advancement uh, of science in the Renaissance, and it's one that we are, of course, quite proud of here in Florence. Um, you know, we have the publications, which of course get Galileo into a little bit of trouble. These are based on his observations of that same year. Uh, the Starry Messenger is the uh, traditional English title for the treatise published in March of 1610, uh, including some beautiful prints uh, based on the drawings of Galileo himself. And basically what he's arguing is that the idea that had been promoted for centuries, uh, that the Earth was in the center of the celestial system, uh, was in fact false, and that the Earth orbited like the other planets around the Sun. Now, this doesn't seem too hard for us to grasp today. What you can see on the uh, left is a heliocentric uh, model of our solar system, the, the blue planet being um, Earth, of course, the third rock. Uh, what you're seeing on the right is the lengths to which astronomers attempted to explain what they observed from the surface of the Earth as these planets moved across the night sky. So this was the understanding of the Sun and all of the planets moving around a stationary Earth, giving us this completely wild uh, uh, sort of pattern here uh, of orbit. So thanks again, Galileo. Uh, you got us on the right track and we know a little bit better what's going on out there now. Um, that, of course, received wanted and unwanted attention, and of course, it will be during the papacy of the Tuscan Pope, Matteo Barberini, Urban VIII, uh, that Galileo's trial takes place. He gets off relatively easily. He is relinquished to um, house arrest, and he eventually dies here in Tuscany. So while we have these sorts of uh, commemorative plaques and paintings and uh, things on these houses. Uh, many of them come from much later. So does his tomb, which you can find in the church of Santa Croce. Um, this is the uh, Herald device, the, the, the scudo of the family. It's what you can also see on the tomb if you visit the Franciscan Basilica of Santa Croce, where you can find the tomb uh, designed by Gian Battista Fuggini, uh, produced many years after his death. He was uh, entombed originally in the Medici Chapel of that church. Uh, when his body was moved into this tomb, um, I don't know if you know this about Italians, we love digging up body parts and sort of putting them on display. Uh, so we took a couple of body parts from the remains of Galileo, including uh, fingers, a tooth, and several vertebra. I believe the vertebra are in Padua today, where he was also uh, a student professor. What we have uh, in the Science Museum here in Florence, which is rightly named after him, is his middle finger. Uh, a very secular middle finger at that being pre presented here almost as a holy relic. So, I mean, this is just a great example of kind of Florentine humor, uh, but also honest reverence for one of their, uh, uh, one of their great locals. Um, I wanted to go quickly now, so we're running out of time, but uh, we've got a big block of the city, a big area of the city here between the Costa San Giorgio, the Forte Belvedere, and the Boboli Gardens, which uh, very few people have seen. Uh, it is a series of monastic complexes that had been built onto the Church of San Giorgio alla Costa, uh, including the Church of St. Jerome and Francesco, its associated convent. Uh, and the convent of the Church of San Giorgio. Uh, these were the um, conventual areas that were um, suppressed by Napoleon. They were later suppressed again uh, following unification and the formation of the modern state. Uh, they were briefly reopened by uh, Ferdinand III, uh, the Habsburg Lorraine Grand Duke, who I don't really want to talk about too much except to uh, say that it's his birthday today. You know, I love birthdays, so happy birthday to you. Uh, he, looking here very Austrian indeed in his portrait in Vienna, uh, he briefly opened up the um, convents following the um, restitution of his title, following um, Napoleon's exile to Elba, uh, but they would be suppressed once again following the mod modern state, and this is of course uh, par for the course. What you're looking at here in Florence are um, all of the convents that were suppressed by the mid-19th century. Uh, some of them have been returned to a sort of museum environment. Uh, many of them have been used for public services such as hospitals, schools, uh, and many of them were actually used for military purposes. So here are just the uh, sort of major convents that were uh, taken over by the Italian military, uh, including the one that I'm showing you um, here at number 12, uh, the ex sort of convent of San Giorgio, uh, 
St. Girolamo and uh, Francesco alla Costa, uh, this area had been uh, converted into barracks for the military, uh, basically as a school of medicine in the late 1920s, 1930s. It was abandoned uh, after the war uh, and has been falling apart ever since. It is the topic of a sort of controversial uh, project of development uh, now, starting since 2018. Uh, basically, this area is being converted into a massive uh, luxury hotel complex. It's being headed by the headed by the Limestone uh, Group. Uh, that is, of course, the uh, operation of the famous uh, Argentine uh, Lowenstein family. Uh, that is the same family who purchased the Medici Villa up at. Uh, the Mugello uh, that is also being converted into a luxury rental. Uh, they're not really sure how to do this because of the very awkward situation of the um, convents. Uh, basically, they're talking about having some sort of entrance from the Bobley Gardens that would allow people to get to these areas once they're restored and transformed into accommodations. Um, it's a massive tract of land. Uh, and I'm sure it was halted by the lockdown. So it'll be interesting to see uh, what becomes of it. Um, and I'm hopeful to be able to get in there one day because, as you know, uh, many of these conventual sitting, uh, settings are the homes of some of our most important representations of Christ's Last Supper. Uh, what we have inside of the ex-convent of Santi Girolamo and Francesco is a Last Supper attributed to Cosimo Rosselli from the 1480s. You can see a bit better uh, image of it here. Uh, so let's hope that this becomes a semi-public space of that uh, new hotel complex and we can all go in and enjoy that together with the many others that we have here in the city of Florence. Uh, going up from that project uh, where we start getting the walling in of the Costa, we have a very um, sort of nondescript entrance into the last uh, location that I'll point out to you today. Uh, this is the entrance to the Villa Bardini uh, which also provides access to the villa, uh, to the Bardini Gardens. Uh, and this is a wonderful uh, sort of feature of the city that is again, a sort of a closed and reopened story. This has been um, in private hands basically since the 17th century. It's based on designs by the architect Gerardo Silvani, uh, who produced it for Francesco Manadori. This villa was originally referred to as the Villa Manadora. Uh, and it was from there uh, purchased by uh, uh, other owners, uh, and then eventually is purchased by the prolific art dealer, Stefano Bardini, um, whose extraordinary career um, results in the formation of many of the collections of Italian and Florentine art uh, that we have uh, in Italian museums as well as museums abroad. Uh, he is able to purchase the gardens from the Mozzi family as well as this villa. Uh, and he leaves that to his son, Ugo. Uh, when Ugo dies in 1965, it's sort of given to the state and we've got a bit of a sort of a bureaucratic problem here. Um, only in 1996 is it secured for a public sort of venue, uh, sort of public uh, event space. Uh, so this is another one of the great exhibition areas that we have for traveling shows here in Florence. It offers beautiful views over the town, uh, especially from the parapets of the garden. And it's also the home to the famous uh, Glicini or uh, Wisteria uh, trees, which I'm sure many of you know if you've been sort of pining for Florence and searching online for bits and pieces of Florence on lockdown, uh, you'll know that the Bardini Gardens have since put up a live webcam. So if you've really got nothing to to do. Uh, you can sort of, sort of sit and watch these uh, wisteria sort of slowly bud and flower. I didn't invite you to do that because I think they're still pretty much in full bloom at this point in early May. Um, this is just another glimpse at what we have here in Florence and what we're all eagerly awaiting to uh, you know, sort of get back to. Uh, I'm hoping that you've enjoyed this talk and at this point I would be happy to uh, stop sharing my screen and answer any questions you might have. Thank you very much. Thank you very much indeed, Jeremy. And now it's your turn to ask some questions or share some memories of the Costa San Giorgio or whatever you want. Uh, if you want to speak, unmute and say something. If you're not speaking, mute, mute up again, please. Well, hello. I wanted to say something. Hello. Hi, Rosanna. Hi. Hi, Bernadette. Hi, Bernadette was here. I lived on the coast of San Giorgio, as I let Simon know. <laughs> mm -hmm. In the 80s, I lived at number 59. It was my first, my first home in Florence. 
And it was before the Costa de Manoli, or I think it was the Costa de Manoli, you went up, okay. Um, and it was just, there, there was an intersection and above that was the, was the, the army, the Scuola Sanita, That's, which yep. was still there. When I was there, the Scuola Sanita was still there and there was this awful little bar above me and below them that all the soldiers would hang out and they'd, they'd, there was a phone, a pay phone and they had to put their tokens in to call their girlfriends. It was, it was pretty funny. It, it was a great street. It was a great street. Wonderful. I, I had, uh, I never even went in San Giorgio La Costa. I had a couple things to say. One, one is a memory and then, then some questions. A memory was across from where I lived, which I was renting, uh, renting a room in, you know, it wasn't even a whole apartment. Um, there was the Gucci house. Oh yeah. Okay. The Gucci house. And we were on the, th I don't know what this, what to call these floors. And in, 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 a, in, a, in Italy, it would be terzo piano. I guess it's fourth floor in, in America. And I don't know what it's in England with stairs, no? And we put the, the wash out on the, the line outside, no? And we could look straight in the Gucci house and they had, in, they had a, a palatial house with huge windows. And I, I could see like all of Florence through their windows. You know, it was incredible. <laughs> I could, I could, I had the view through their windows with no curtains. Okay. There was uh, the wife. I don't know which Gucci it was. I have no idea. We never spoke to any of them. The wife was English with red hair and she'd come in from the countryside, wherever that was. And she'd always bring flowers in and things like that. But um, I'm glad you, the two things I, I had, one thing, one more thing I want to say, and then I have a question. I, as being a professional journalist, was invited to see that the ex caserma, okay, because they let the the journalists come in a couple of years ago. The whole family was there speaking. The 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 the, the man who's going to restore it, his wife, and, the, and all that. I saw the fresco. I didn't know what it was because they didn't tell us, you know. But you know, if you ever want to see it, uh, I'm sure I could arrange it. I think. I I think what I've been able to read is that, you know, the area, and that's not the only thing, there's another sort of fantastic fresco, which I couldn't even find a, a sort of an attribution for that I, I, I didn't put in the talk. Uh, but it looks like there's a similar uh, large wall fresco depicting maybe the, the, the supper at the House of Levi. Um, there's, some, there's some good stuff there. I mean, I saw some of the photos from before too, where like the floors are falling out and everything, and it looked like the like the military basically trashed the place. I know that they didn't, but you know, after years of, of being uh, you know, neglected, it was, it was in pretty rough shape. Um, so I think that that's probably going to be, you know, if they're having semi-public spaces up there where there's restaurants and bars and things, I, ca I can imagine this in their best interest to make that accessible. You know, I mean, we've got uh, the Convento delle de de Calze in, uh, just inside Porta Romana. Mm -hmm. uh, that has the Francibigio Last Supper, and that's one that they've always been very kind. If you've got students and you want to go in, I think it's basically their conference room. I actually taught a class in there one summer. Uh, but, you know, they're, they're very good about, like, you know, when they've got art like that, you know, letting people go in to see it. So, you know, I don't think that we have to worry about what's in there getting sort of locked down, um, you know, once, once it becomes... Uh, well, if there's minor. ever a press, another press presentation, I'll invite you along. Okay. Because they, I mean, they definitely want us to come because they definitely want us to write about it, you know. And, you know, like I said, we, I was there and they did not tell me what this fresco was. And I went and looked at it. I'm sorry I didn't take a photo. They talked about putting an escalator <laughs> up the coast of San Giorgio for, the, for their clients or, 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 or one of those tapeti that, you know, you stand on and it goes uphill. They were planning to do that, too. Yep. We got a great lunch, you know. And then we never heard anything else. So I assume I, I you know, we'll, we, we will hear about it. We will get invited. What, and, what happens know. a lot, what happens a lot in Florence is that you have these very ambitious projects of, of sort of development that, you know, um, have their initial sort of phase of approval. They go a bit public about it, you know, they involve the press and then that invites all sorts of people to, you know, come in and complain about what they're doing. Um, I think one of the genuine concerns is the fact that, you know, we've had since, the Middle Ages, you know, like landslides and all these sorts of problems with the with the area, uh, that a lot of development just sort of putting in underground parking or you know like how is the 
how is the uh, the food delivery stuff going to get up there? You know, I mean, you're talking about these really tiny roads to get up there. How's it going to affect the life of the residents in that neighborhood? Um, I've also seen the plan of having some access point basically through the Vobley Garden, some kind of funicular or escalator, like you said. Uh, so it's, it's interesting. We'll see what happens with it. Okay. Well, it, the place is a wreck, I can tell you. You're right. It's a wreck. I saw it. And the floors are all, you know, destroyed. But anyway, my questions are, and I don't know if you're able to answer them. I had a photographer who was well known, he's dead now, been dead for a while, Liberto Perugi, who took art photos. He's sort of a contemporary of Antonio Quattroni and that man and Pistoia, whose name I can't remember, but he had a studio at the bottom. I didn't live there at the time because you know I, I wasn't working as a journalist. Exact, I worked, started working a year later. He had an, a studio in the Convento di Santa Catarina at the bottom. Do you know anything about the Convento di Santa Catarina at the bottom of San Giorgio? You probably don't, um, huh? It was a women's convent. It was also suppressed. Um, there is an apartment on that same side of the road where supposedly Santa Catarina di Siena had um, stayed briefly. Um, I don't know much about the convent okay. specifically, but it, it falls into a larger narrative of sort of what happens to those spaces. Well, no, I, I thank you because there is a plaque there. It said Convento. I mean, I would go to Liberto's studio, you know, and I mean, we at that time we were talking about, you know, slides and medium and large format. It wasn't digital, you know, and uh, <laughs> you know, I I would go and it's a Convento Santa Caterina. I'd walk in, you know, incredibly beautiful, incredibly ancient. No clue to what this was, you know. <laughs> So I know it has I think, to it's example, I think it's a great example of, you know, what Florence has to offer. And, uh, you know, that's really the point of, of what we're trying to do here is make sure that everyone can, you know, keep up their enthusiasm, even if it takes a bit to, to get okay. back. Um, I noticed that we're almost at the hour. And so I do want to make sure that anyone else who has okay. questions. Okay, one quick, do you have know about um, Sarah Baker has a, uh, has a question. Sarah. Hi. Sarah, is on a, I, 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 Hi, Sarah. Hi, sorry to obsess about, about this, this project that's going on. I live literally right on top of it. And it's been very quiet, but they've started work again. And I have walked and walked and walked to try to figure out how they're going to get in there. And I can't, I don't, I don't think it's possible. Unless they expect everyone to walk in, they've got a little gate. Open up when it comes to San Giorgio, but there is something I've got on my map over here. There's something called the Vicolo della Cava. But it's you know, they're going to have to have a, a, a way for guests to get in there, and they're going to also have uh, something kind of behind the scene where the trucks and drop offs oh, can access. So. But I, I, I fear I'll have to move if it ever works. <laughs> anyway, thank you, thank you so much. I just, um, anybody wants to come in and, you know, observe the construction, just let me know and I'll, I'll let you. Take Thanks, Sarah. Uh, yeah. I think David Wilkins might have a question. Do you want to say something, David? No, he's not there. I'll, he, unmute, he, my, I'll unmute myself. I wanted to oh, know David. about the Museo Anigoni, which was up there at one time. What's happened to that? Uh, I don't know. I can't, I can't keep up with the changes uh, with the museums uh, in the city anymore. You know, when I, the first 15 years I lived here, the, the, nothing changed, everything was where you left it. And then now I have no idea how it's being managed, who's managing it, I don't know. It's um, still there. It's still there? It's still there, it's a permanent exhibition. Yeah, yeah, yeah. it's a very good one too, yeah. I think those are gonna be the places that will probably have a, you know, an easier time reopening and sort of letting people in with with, with distancing and in sort of limited numbers you know i mean smaller mm -hmm. places like that will probably be the the, the better places to go yeah uh, once you're back it's mm -hmm. lovely there's there's also a restaurant there as well which is nice and you can have Hi, tea in the garden <laughs> hi <laughs> and then, yeah. but it's, it's interesting what you're saying there jeremy because the the talk in town now is very much about when the international visitors start returning uh, uh, there's a hope and indeed an expectation and a preparation for a slower form of um, tourism. Uh, Elke Schmidt at the Uffizi wrote an article about that and how he's hoping that um, the sort of the, the selfie and run crowd aren't going to be around so much and it will be more longer, fewer 
because it's fewer people staying for longer. Mm. And if that does come about, it will be a, um, a good outcome for, for everybody, for the visitors and the residents, I think. Yeah. Um, but we need to wrap in a moment. So I'm, I'm just going to um, ask Jeremy just to say a little bit about uh, the new uh, seminar series that he's starting on Monday. Um, so Jeremy, chance to do a commercial. Uh, <laughs> thanks, I wasn't planning to give a commercial. Uh, we've got great uptake. Uh, we've got a page on the website, uh, which explains a bit what we're trying to pilot. Uh, I think most of the sessions for the first uh, seminar are, are basically pulled up, so I'm, I'm, I'm delighted about that. Uh, we have a second one that's going to come out uh, in two weeks, uh, in which we'll be taking a look at some uh, works of Italian art that we can find in collections, maybe closer to where uh, all of you find yourselves. So sort of going around the world, sort of hunt after Florence. Um, and I'm trying to think about ways to adapt what we've always done here in the library, you know, with the advantage of having museums and squares and sculptures and all these sorts of things at our fingertips. You know, I'm trying to figure out a way how to uh, you know, continue with that sort of teaching uh, remotely. So um, we're going to be looking in the first seminar, which I think is probably likely to repeat uh, maybe a little bit later in the spring or the summer. Um, if you guys want to have another run of it, I'd be happy to do it. Um, basically looking at how we can use uh, online resources, how we can use free access databases. If you're not, uh, you know, associated with an academic institution, you might not have access to uh, JSTOR or some of the other uh, sort of research databases. So, you know, ways to take a look at other free access sites, um, how to also take a look at some of the great examples of, of Florentine literature and Florentine records that have been digitized, uh, where to find them uh, as a way to, you know, not say, oh, look, this is what we have here, but, you know, we are far away from it. Uh, ways that you can access it directly. So uh, we'll be doing that sort of thematically in the first um, seminar. And then we'll be taking a look again at um, something that I think we never have to worry about here in Florence because most of the stuff that we, we look at with our students um, in Florentine museums and Florentine churches has sort of always been here. Uh, but one thing that I'm really excited to start uh, looking at in the second seminar is the movement of Italian art out of Italy uh, that brings in all sorts of things, uh, you know, regarding the art market and attribution and collections and display and sort of, you know, how uh, someone like myself experienced Italian art for the first time, uh, you know, going to school in Boston. Uh, what do we have there? Uh, that's what inspired me essentially to come and live in Florence and to, and to study art history here. So um, a way to sort of think about, you know, how Renaissance art survives and is carried into modern times and what happens to it. Uh, that's sort of the core of what we're hap what's happening in the second seminar. Um, I'm working on about 11 sort of projects at once, so I think I'm going to take a break tonight and not think about any of them. Uh, but once we get going next week, with those of you that have signed up for the um, uh, first seminar, I think there are a couple spots left on the 9 a.m. session. Um, once we sort of see how that goes, I'm really excited to make more. And I really want to bring in the team as well and get some of our other lecturers uh, helping out uh, continuing this program online. So uh, we'll be able to see each other in that context. Yeah, well, thanks very much, Jeremy, for, for you and your team for putting that together, because the, the, the plan, I mean, the reality is, I'm afraid, folks, that we know that um, uh, you're not going to be able to physically visit Florence for quite a while now. Um, so we're, the Institute are going to keep it all going um, in online as best we can. Um, so stick with the program and uh, keep your fix of Florence until such time when you can come back and enjoy it all in a slower uh, more relaxed way. Um, okay, I think that's probably it. Thank you very much, everybody. Uh, next week, we've got uh, Professor Richard Hodges, who is a world-class archaeologist, who's going to be talking about a dig that he did over towards uh, the, the Marema on the coast, uh, where they discovered all sorts of stuff, which is really important for re understanding better the transition from the ruins of the Roman Empire into the um, medieval stage of Tuscany. Um, Richard, I say, is, is uh, top of his profession and a good talker, an old friend, um, and he'll be on next week, same time, same place. Uh, meanwhile, look after yourself, everyone, wherever you may be. Have a good day, have a good evening, and alla, alla prossima settimana. Ciao, ciao. Ciao, ciao. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you very, very much. Wonderful. Thank you. 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 Thank you.